Welcome to the new Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news on the local Colorado economy and initiatives that focus on the development of cybersecurity economics. You don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert to get plugged in. Your host, Chris Gorog, brings it straightforward, asks the tough questions, and brings the cyber world to a level of understanding for everyone. Chris is personable and opens up with our guests on the issues we all would like to see addressed. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join our host as he introduces the topic for today's New Cyber Frontier. So welcome today to the New Cyber Frontier podcast. On with me today, I have some very honored guests. I'm at beautiful University of Denver in Denver, Colorado. And I have the Chancellor of University of Denver, Chancellor Rebecca Chop. Welcome today, Rebecca. Thank you. It's great to be here. And also, I have with me a, another guest that's uh, the, the Dean of the Ritchie School of Computer Engineering, J.B. Holston. Good to be here, and it's the Ritchie School of Computer Science and Engineering. Computer Science and Engineering. I knew one of those things I would get wrong. Computers, engineering, they all just merge. And, and my, my undergrad's in computer engineering, so that's what always comes well, there you go. Oh, well, that's there you a go. Wonderful, wonderful undergrad. That's good to know. You can come back for grad school if you'd like in cybersecurity, perhaps. I am actually looking at that and deciding where I'm going to work on a PhD, so Great. we might have to talk Great. about that We're here. In the, yeah, all done. Um, but today we are talking about the Colorado effort in cybersecurity, and uh, we wanted to bring University of Denver in, the National Cyber Intelligence Center can be in Colorado Springs. University of Denver, though, is short commute distance up here in South Denver, and uh, we wanted to talk to you guys about what is going on at University of Denver and what you're doing in the state of Colorado for the cyber efforts. So, first of all, welcome to both of you, and if I'd like to kind of one at a time give the listeners a background, some personal about yourself, maybe like your job or how you got to where you're at. Uh, but we'll start out with you, JB. Uh, I've been dean here for about a year, and I'm what's called a non-traditional dean, which means that I come from a background other than academic. Uh, I, my background is industry, both large companies and small. Most recently, the last 20 years, recent in my world, uh, I've been a tech entrepreneur and uh, started and sold six different entities here in uh, Colorado in uh, the tech field. Delighted to be here, largely here because of the leadership of Chancellor Chop. That is an interesting background for a dean. Were you, before a year ago, were you a dean or teaching somewhere else? Or? The, the, right before this, I was running, I started and ran an initiative in Colorado called the Blackstone Entrepreneurs Network. I have been, I'm aware of the Blackstone Entrepreneurs Network. Yeah. So, Which was an initiative we started with, primarily with Senator Bennett and Governor Hickenlooper to really promote uh, companies that have the prospect to be very big employers and very big companies for the long haul here in, uh, in the state. In fact, that's through that process that I think we first started to get the governor aware of some of the cybersecurity firms that were emerging quickly in Colorado. Interesting. So you've had a big role previous, prior to the, the kind of the governor's initiative to set up the NCIC. You've been involved with this. I have, as have others here. Um, Eric Matisik, who we brought in to run Project Excite, who's the state's chief innovation officer, has also was also tasked with the governor while he was head of the Colorado Technology Association, on whose board I sit, uh, to uh, to help pull the whole initiative together as well. So we've had a lot of familiarity with it over the last uh, year. Okay. And the Colorado Technical Association, what exactly do they do? So the Colorado Tech Association is uh, the trade association for the technology industry here in Colorado. I think it represents something like 6,000 tech employers uh, from the very largest, you know, DISH CIO is on the board with me to the very smallest startup. Uh, but it's a trade association for the technology community here in Colorado. Okay. okay. Are they mostly Denver focused no. or all no, over the state? Way. Okay. All right. So this is, uh, I, there's some other things we're going to talk about there. And I know I have worked with Eric Matisik. We've talked about having him as a guest as well. So maybe that'll firm up as well. But, uh, Chancellor Schaub, give us a background on yourself. Well, I'm, a, I'm the chancellor. I've been here for two years. One of the things that attracted me to the University of Denver was the state of Colorado and the amazing things going on in the front range, but uh, across the street, across the state. You know, I think, I think the University of Denver is really an anchor institution uh, for the Rocky Mountain area. We provide a lot of intellectual capital. We, we 70% of our undergrads come from out of state. 70% of our grad undergrads stay in state. 
So we provide a lot of the professionals. We provide a lot of the research in a whole range of not only computer science and engineering, but social work, psychology, law, and of course, business. So our university is getting more and more engaged in the big issues for Colorado, and cybersecurity, cyber defense is certainly a big issue. It's got to be a big issue for all of us, every person. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. In the big issues for Colorado, and cybersecurity, cyber defense is certainly a big issue. It's got to be a big issue for all of us. Every person should be well aware of the challenges facing cybersecurity facing us with cyber uh, security. We should also be aware, and of special interest to me, is that it's a huge field for jobs. So 12,000 jobs now open in the state of Colorado alone. And of course, we, are, we pledge to help the state address all its issues and its opportunities. We also make another promise, which is we want our students to have jobs. And that's a, that's a good uh, approach to take, because why are students going to college? To get a job. So I always wonder, people that are in a chancellor's position, did you always want to be at the top of education? Did, what was your, how'd you get there? Oh my goodness, I'm a first generation college student. My parents did not want me to go to college. They were of the mindset that young girls and born in the 1950s didn't need to go to college. So I wandered into college. Um, I was a religion major. I taught religion for many, many years, became provost at Emory University, and just um, kept having these great opportunities that education provides people. So, no, I had no idea. I, I wouldn't have known what a president or chancellor was as a university. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of have a similar background where I grew up in a very blue collar community where education college was actually looked at as, well, why do you need that type of thing? So I know exactly what you're talking about there. But we'll go with a religion major background. What is your definition, before we get the JB, of cybersecurity? Well, I'm, uh, JB will give a much more. <laughs> I'm aware of that, but that's why I started with you. But I will tell you, I went to this convening that our project Excite um, hosted along with um, the University of Colorado and Colorado Springs. And it was really my first intense experience of listening to experts. Um, we had professionals from Israel, we had lots of professionals from Colorado. Um, I, I pretty much was scared because I think I, you know, there's nothing like listening for six or seven hours about the depth of the threat. Now, you know, we all worry about it on just an individual level. Can my identity be thrown, be, be stolen? Um, am I going to be hacked today? I, I was actually fished yesterday. Um, so we worry about that, but you magnify that and think about what that can do to the, to the business, to the marketplace, to the economy, what it could do to healthcare, what it could do to national defense. It's really a phenomenal threat that is both very, very broad and very deep. So I think that's, a, that's kind of an existential definition, but it made me well aware that we need to do everything we can to prepare professionals to work in this field that have the technical skills but also the leadership skills to do what we have to do to face this threat. So you know I hear so many times that fear drives us into this this cybersecurity arena um, but if we could turn and look at because so many times cybersecurity is a cost center to businesses how do we look at maybe making something other than fear the driver to cybersecurity any thoughts on that? Well, I know, putting you on the spot here, but. Yeah, it's not a question I had actually thought of before, so it's a really good question. Um, 
One of the things that impressed me in this conference that um, Pam Shockley and JB and others organized were these professionals from Israel. And, you know, they, Israel now leads the world <laughs> in, in this and in other fields re relating to technology. And you really see a, a country whose major and greatest resource is their intelligence and their work ethic and their ability to collaborate. So I think um, cybersecurity really also provides, if you're looking at it from a university's perspective, um, an area to do what we care about the most um, and what we believe we contribute to the world and to the future, which is intelligence, work, <laughs> figuring out problems, figuring out opportunities. So, you know, as in other fields that I have to evaluate and say, should we add this to the university? It's really about, is this somewhere we can contribute that will add to human flourishing, that will add to individuals getting job, that will allow our faculty and staff and community partners to uh, benefit but also to create benefits for the broader community. Okay, well thank you. Now to JB, give us your definition of cybersecurity. Yeah, I, I would go with hers, because that was great. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we don't need another one. Um, seriously, it's, it's a sort, it is an existential issue for this generation uh, around the world, and I think that's the best way to think about it. You know, it's a fundamental issue that all of us have to confront. But having said that, I think your second question is interesting too, which is how do you position this so that people think of it as not, not from a place of fear? And, one of the ways that I've heard it position, which I think is good, particularly as we look to diversify the people who are interested in potentially studying the, the area, is sort of think of how we thought about the environment in the 60s, or water in particular. And you know, we sort of all rallied around, because I'm old enough to remember, we all rallied around the notion that we should protect it. You know, it was a fundamental resource, it was a vital resource, we all live with it, we can't get, get by without it, we access it all the time. The internet's like that now. Right, the internet is a, as fundamental a resource and as much a you know, part of our fundamental environment as water was back in the 60s. So, so if we position this more as, well, you know, just as we decided we needed to keep the environment safe in the 60s, so we need to keep the fundamental environment that we live in, which is the internet, safe today. And so positioning it a little bit more as um, sort of investing in that fundamental resource and keeping it safe for the long haul is less a position of fear than a position of, um, you know, sort of naturally I would care about trying to uh, to ensure that that's all good and kosher and clean and safe for the long haul. Um, but I think the definition is, is a great one. I just think you're 10 years younger than me. I grew up in the 50s, so it reminds me of the fear we had about yeah, the communist threat. You yeah. grew up in the 60s, yeah, right? And that's so a good it's point. much more. Smokey the bear. It's really interesting. Yeah. Another relation might be now the kind of global warming and the green people yeah. paying more than they'll ever get out of a car just to make sure it's green, yeah. to have a statement that they comply with the green. Right. Yeah. And, and that, yeah, that's a good, good example of it. And I look at there's, you know, we're at the point now where technology booms have taken off. But now we're kind of, a lot of things are coming out to blend society and technology. Like the Ubers, where they don't have any cars, they don't have any employees. They're solving a social problem. And I think cybersecurity is the biggest socio-technological air problem that we have to address. So I think your definition, that's a great one. And uh, very interesting that, uh, that that is that kind of a focus then around what Denver University is doing with their programs? Well, I'll take that first. I mean, we're, we're certainly, uh, um, it's one of the things that we're certainly good at and getting better at. Uh, and we are having, we have new offerings. So we, are, we just launched a new master's in cybersecurity. Uh, and what's different about that are three things. One is it's one year rather than two. Um, secondly, we've, um, we've priced it at half price because the view is, hey, for folks now who want to pivot their career into a field like cybersecurity, that kind of one year reasonably priced immersive kind of an opportunity is a really good formula. Um, and a third thing is it's industry connected from the start. So every student, when they start the program, is adopted by a company. And uh, they actually will, at the end of it, do a capstone project, the last three months, or a capstone project at, at industry. And that's a really unique set uh, of offerings. But, but I think to the Chancellor's point, um, you know, we've got a broader opportunity than just kind of a technical, a technology-based degree in cybersecurity, which, by the way, is targeting students who have no technical background, because the first three months are essentially bridge courses to give you a sufficient technical background to do it. 
and I think that's around the kind of issues you were talking about and you were mentioning as well, which have to do with policy and law and you know, international versus domestic uh, policy kind of implications. So, so I think over time, one of our real opportunities is to become, this is partly what we were trying to convey with the uh, cybersecurity convening, that you know, DU is kind of a place, a platform within Colorado where we can have that broadest uh, conversation and investigation of these really fundamental um, issues uh, for society now and opportunities for society now. And cybersecurity clearly is one of those. And it's clearly multidiscipline. You know, it's, it's science is important, but if you talk to any chief information security officer, they'll tell you that organizational behavior is at least as critical as anything they can do on the technology front. They'll, Absolutely. You know, you know, they each have 46 different solutions they're trying to make work. But at the end of the day, if people don't do the right stuff internally, then it's not going to work. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. Front, you Absolutely. Know, you know, they each have 46 different solutions they're trying to make work, but at the end of the day, if people don't do the right stuff internally, then it's not going to work. Yeah, interesting. So is that in the computer science department, or is that under our business side? The, the master's in cybersecurity is in, is in CS. Some of the things we're looking at that I was just talking about would certainly be broader. Project Excite, which was the entity that was the umbrella for the convening mm -hmm. with the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, is um, chaired essentially by the deans of business, law, and myself. So by definition, it's, uh, it's interdisciplinary. Okay. And, th and that's kind of what my, my thoughts are, and is that we need to really the technical people understand what the need for cybersecurity is, and the engineers have been on board for a while. But that cross, and it sounds great that you're starting a program like that, of pulling this into the organization, the society, the business, is really where, where I've seen personally that, that the gap exists. You know, I mean, how, how often do we say our business department and our technical departments can't talk because they don't seem to talk the same language uh, and what do we do? We say, okay, the engineers need to understand how to integrate with the business. But it might be really that the business needs to learn how to talk to the engineers. And, and of course, we also have a very uh, large liberal arts program. And in many ways, that permeates all of our professional schools and all of our programs, which is really about how, how you get people to work together, how you get people to problem solve, how you, how you get to innovate. So I think one of the nice uniquenesses about our degree pro program is that people will not only have the technical skills, but they'll have this kind of liberal arts approach to help people uh, work together to solve these issues. So do you see that cybersecurity is going to be a little bit in every degree path then that you, or you, you uh, focus on, or is it going to be a university almost focus? Um, uh, you know, so I'd, I'd give you my answer. I, I think that uh, security-related issues are already in the curriculum in a lot of different offerings at the school, uh, at the university. So Corbell, our, our great international school, has a master's and MA in international security. And part of the coursework there is around issues that have to do with digital security. As you were talking about, there's sort of no topic that you're going to touch now that won't have a digital or tech component. Um, so I think you're going to see you're going to see anything that has to do with um, with security, uh, whether it's in law, whether it's in business, et cetera, et cetera, um, talk to cybersecurity issues. Uh, but um, you know that doesn't necessarily mean that we're not going to have a school of cybersecurity that is separate from, or nor are we going to have sort of a um, uh, um, uh, sort of an Uber offering that uh, that overwhelms all of the other offerings from the other schools. But I think you'll see it inform things from every one of the schools. And we certainly could um, have additional degree programs. I, you know, yeah. this is our first one to launch, and I think it's it's meeting with real success. It's recognized by the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, but as your good question, uh, what it made me think of was, well, you know, maybe we use DU itself as a platform, an experiment to help everybody 
get some consciousness, to raise awareness, because it is about human behavior. It's not just technical, as we were talking about. So maybe we could start a movement on our campus about how an organization becomes aware. You know, I would love to see uh, a university that says, no matter what degree program you're in, here's the one class, the two classes you have to take that says how that degree, how that line of study, how that part of the business interfaces in the virtual cyber world. And because we're all connected there nowadays, there isn't anything we do. And I, I saw a stat that now, like 90% of the people in the workforce, their, la their labors, more than half of their labors are virtual. 30 years ago, that was not even a possibility. So we've changed our society to everybody now. Like we all learned that how to, you know, when we learn how to drive, we learned the customary, everybody stays on the right side of the road. If everybody stops at the intersections, everybody obeys the traffic lights. The common set of standards that everybody lives by now in the virtual world is really cybersecurity that controls the common set of standards needs to be addressed no matter what degree path we're in. I, I mean, look, I think uh, I think just to borrow words from the chancellor, you've talked about digital literacy mm -hmm. as something which right. students and parents generally um, come to the university now, certainly the undergraduate level, and have an expectation that the students will come out the other end with with literacy, with digital literacy. I think it's broader than cybersecurity. Uh, I think I think cybersecurity is one of the components of digital literacy, but I think uh, I think it's both broader than and also, um, but but involves that. Um, so you know. If I'm an art student now and I'm going to have my portfolio up on YouTube right. and all the rest of these kinds of media, it's great if I can have done that while I'm here, in my view. And, and one of the things that I'll learn in the process of figuring out how to do that is security-related stuff. You know, how do I do that and make sure that I've done the right things from a security standpoint? So you know, I would certainly agree. I think digital literacy is a, is a defining need for, uh, uh, for every student now. And, and really, it, it's inescapable for our students. I mean, it's the way our faculty teach. They teach other ways, too. But um, I don't think students could really escape an, a, a rich digital environment uh, in any program at the university. And you know, we're, we're in our latest strategic plan. We're requiring all of our undergrads to have electronic portfolios. So they will really just like they love to curate themselves right. on Facebook or you know, LinkedIn or whatever. They'll be curating their progress through education, learning to reflect on it, thinking about value added. And you know, the digital transformation of education is simply phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we can do, how we run our business, just like any other business has been transformed, um, and how we think about education has been completely changed. Definitely. So now shifting gears a little bit, the effort in Colorado. We talked about it originally when we, we introduced both of you, that JB has worked a lot probably before the effort started into how does all the organizations in Colorado fit into it. So give, I don't know who we want to address first, but let's talk about that effort from as far back as you've been involved to you know where it is now and how you see both yourselves and the university being involved. Well, I can I can talk a little bit about the history uh, as a as a start. Well, here, so. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, and then uh, talk to ask the chancellor maybe to talk a little bit more about DU's connection to it. So I'll, we'll do a bit of a handoff. But um, probably two years ago or so, uh, there were a number of folks around town who were becoming aware that we were that a cluster was emerging uh, without people knowing. Um, uh, so about a year and a half ago, actually under the aegis of the Blackstone effort. We pulled together a convening at the governor's mansion. There were about 200 folks, uh, and it was around cyber. Uh, the governor was there, the head of economic development. We did a bunch of panels. Um, it was a little different than the one that we did here in that it was very industry focused. It was all about let's raise awareness within Colorado that the industry actually already uh, exists. And uh, that was probably, uh, boy, a year, year and a half, more than a year ago. It was a, uh, I lose track of time, maybe uh, almost two years ago now. So did that, that raised a lot of awareness, um, but there was already a big industry, both down in the Springs, which was very defense oriented, a lot of smaller companies, very service oriented, but also in Denver. Um, at that point, there were five private companies based in Denver that were each worth a billion or more in the cybersecurity field, and, and no one knew. So, so I think that started to raise awareness within the community generally that the cluster already existed. Then the governor went, uh, took a trip around the world in October, um, 
kindly invited me to go. I couldn't because I was busy with real work, but, uh, but it was a great trip. And one of, the, one of the places he stopped was Israel. And as part of that, he, he met with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, with the head of defense, and with a bunch of other folks as well, including many of the folks that we then brought over for the convening. Uh, and that was a central topic. I mean, that whole sort of cybersecurity is both a tremendous business opportunity and an existential issue where we're front and center. So when he came back, the whole idea of the NCIC um, was a lot more formulated, I think, in his mind, be, uh, really based on the conversations in Israel. Uh, he's had a view since, he, since then, certainly even before, that Colorado Springs was a logical place to center it for a whole host of different, uh, of different reasons. Uh, so um, flash forward uh, through the last legislative session, legislation was passed that allowed the funding of the repurposing of the building as a first step. Um, there are, there's an operating board now. There are three sub-boards. I'm on two. Um, and, and that's all about how do we create the center and what does it mean and what do we do and how do we build it going forward. And we're still trying to figure that out to some degree because there are a bunch of different components. Research is a component. A response center is a component. There are a bunch of different components. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to make sure in that whole process is that it's a Colorado-wide initiative, even though based in the Springs. And as part of that, when we did the cybersecurity convening here a few months ago, that's why you know, we reached out to Chancellor Shockley at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, and said, let's do this. Um, you know, the chancellor reached out to, uh, to Pam and said, let's do this together, because it's great for DU to be a platform for this conversation, but this is a Colorado-wide conversation. Mm -hmm. do you, did you ever have any tie-ups that, you know, maybe it should have been Denver? For the, the, for the where I mean, instead of the springs, yeah, um, certainly the governor and I had a number of conversations about how to do this so that it's Colorado wide, um, and and the issue is that the, there there are different cultures between the springs and Denver on the business front. There are different size and kinds of businesses. The military connection there is is uh, doesn't exist here to the same degree, um, but all the large companies that participate in that industry are here up in Denver. So, you know, I think from the start, there's been an active conversation about how do you make sure that, that we bridge that. And again, that's partly why for the convening, you know, we said, let's make sure everyone's here. And when the governor came, you know, he would talk about to a group that represented all of Colorado, what that initiative was, uh, was about. So do you think that the decision for Colorado Springs, maybe I'm gonna ask something you're not privy to, was based more on need, the need for economic growth down there, more so than Denver's already kind of seated in a growth? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think certainly, um, and again, I don't want to speak too much for the governor's view, he's the better one to ask, but you know, certainly there's a lot going on in Colorado Springs, and I know he felt strongly that promoting that is critical to the continued development of the state entirely. But that's different than saying there's a need as much as saying, hey, there's a lot going on, let's promote that. Yeah, you know, I, I would just want to say, I, I, I think that um, it is located down there. We're fully supportive of it. Supportive of it. That doesn't mean that there's not enough work for the rest of us to do. I mean, I think this is a, this is a, a again, as we were talking about, a kind of moral issue. It is, a, it is an issue that every uh, person in the digital world ought to be aware of. It's also about um, growth and job opportunities. And as JB said, the businesses. Um, that support it aren't in the springs, they're in Denver, or, you know, they're up and down the front range, um, hopefully throughout the state in the future. So, uh, so I think for our perspective, it doesn't really matter so much where the center is as that we're in conversation with one another and that we're working together. And I think Colorado is uniquely positioned. The presidents, the chancellors of the universities all work very well together. Our faculty go back and forth. We all have good relationships with uh, business and our, and our local government. So to me, it's not so much where it is yeah. as the fact that we are joined together to see this as an area of huge opportunity for Colorado, which I think is how the governor sees it too. Yeah. If every university um, doubled down on both research and teaching and cybersecurity in a year, in, in Colorado, which won't happen, but if everyone did, we still would probably not meet a quarter of the demand for jobs in the state. So, you know, yes. we, we all couldn't do enough fast enough to meet the demand on the other side. And, and, um, and I think the other thing I just add to that is it's a pretty, we're a very collaborative place. And one of the things that the reason Blackstone picked Colorado for the network was because it's a really collaborative place. There's not a lot of competition right. across geographies, across industries, across political aisles, certainly around innovation and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I think this is clearly a category where that's the case as well. Yeah. So, you know, I, I heard a lot of talk about the governor went over to Israel, was interested, was shown what they have going on over there as a cluster and everything. But connection to the rest of the world, 
Um, I, I personally, and uh, my interest in it is I've been on several standards groups with NIST, with the Electric Power Research Institute at OpenSG, and you know I've seen how those efforts have progressed, and you know when funding was brought in, that uh, a lot of talk happened when funding went away that just kind of dried up, and I think as a economic drive, you know economic driver for a local region has a lot better pretense for driving a cybersecurity effort because they're not driving an agenda, they're not driving a government pushing down a standard. It's we're trying to get a bunch of business, so let's let's foster all of it. Um, what do you think about the connection then to the rest of the country, other cities, the rest of the world? How does that play out over time? Relative to cybersecurity in particular in this relative country? to this effort yeah. in Colorado. Um, Look, I think we can't move fast enough to be as global class as possible around cybersecurity at all levels, whether it's higher education, industry, um, research, centers like NCIC, et cetera. The, the demand is so huge that just to keep up, we can't move fast enough. So again, I don't think it's a competitive thing at domestically so much as it's an opportunity if we, if we move fast. I do think the international connections matter a ton, um, and I think that's part of how both. You know, standards, for example, if you do standards that don't have anything to do with what's going on internationally, they're not really going to be standards in, a, in the world that we're in. Uh, so um, so uh, they both matter. Um, but I think, mostly I think we just have to do what we're trying to do as fast as we can do it, and all the rest of that will play out as long as we're open to those other constituents in the process of, uh, of doing it. I, I think if we were trying to, if we distracted ourselves by saying what's our competitive position relative to Austin and cybersecurity, or you know, how do we make sure that we've got the tightest possible connection with what's happening in France today? You know, we, we've got a lot of work to do to just get going. Uh, well, and, and I guess that's some, I, I've heard kind of two sides of that. Some people say you you know you have to start bringing in everybody at the same time. You can't just have a, a, an effort in cybersecurity develop independent and then spread out. You know, do you think we need to reach out and make those connections? I think we have to be absolutely open. I just think you have to focus your effort on getting, getting things going now here. Um, but you have to be absolutely open and transparent from the start. But I, I don't have any doubt that these initiatives will be that way. And I think, you know, within, within uh, the university world, um, as compared to the business world, we're, we are already global. All of our faculty working in this area, and I know all of the faculty in the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, they are already talking with their colleagues around the world. Faculty today, thanks to the web, are amazingly well connected. So they pretty much know where the leaders are, what the new ideas are. So we will be, it's one of the reasons um, that it's good to have some of the research capacity for this field in the universities, because we yeah, have do. those you know, long uh, highways of connection around the world. That's an interesting point. I'd like to, what kind of research projects do you have going on in cybersecurity right now? Well, I can touch on it from the technical side. Um, we've got a few researchers who do work that's fairly fundamental to it, a couple that are in the security side itself, um, and uh, one who does a lot of really fundamental algorithmic work. A lot of cybersecurity these days is about taking massive pools of huge amounts of data and using algorithmic processes to look at those and ultimately try to predict where the next problem is going to come from. So we've got one of our best researchers in computer science happens to be really, really good at that kind of algorithmic work. I, I can understand about that much of his work. Uh, so uh, so there's, a, there's that. But we also have people in, the other, in other parts of the university as well who are doing really interesting work. So as part of a convening, for example, we had a couple of our faculty from the uh, School of Law talk because cybersecurity and privacy are like this. And so, um, and we've got some really expert folks around privacy related issues in the, in the law school. Um, and, and it's, uh, it's non-trivial. You know, you look at the, uh, the hack of the law firm down in Panama, you know, is that a cybersecurity issue? Is it a privacy issue? Is it a, you know, equity issue? It's all of those, all of those things. So there's a lot of interesting work that touches on the point from lots of different angles going on the, at the university. Part of the reason, back to the whole point, that this is a great topic for the university because we bring a lot to it from a lot of different perspectives. Are you seeing a lot of funding come in, venture capital that's interested in the research projects, things like that? Uh, no. <laughs> I think venture capital and, and, fa and, and academic research are fairly oxymoronic still. Um, and they're sort of opposite ends of the, of the investment spectrum. Um, but, but 
you know, but there is a tremendous amount of industry interest <clears throat> in what we're doing through programs like the Masters in Cybersecurity because they're looking at workforce at workforce development, and it does give us an opportunity through that to um, to explore what the longer tail research issues are. So, for example, we talked to one of the biggest telecommunication companies here in the state about a month ago um, about what we're doing, and they said two things. One is we'll hire everyone that, that you graduate from that program, full stop. Secondly, they, they said maybe we ought to explore trying to sponsor what you're doing in this category more broadly, including research, uh, uh, and uh, to which we said, we said uh, that's great. But that's not venture interest as much as industry prospective yeah. connection. Okay. So if we look at this Colorado effort, NCIC, whatever it's going to be called, I know the name is in flux, what is success? What do we say? That, you know, it's successful if we get this. Well, I can give you a sort of an answer from the NCIC perspective, but I, you know, I, the chancellor can give you a point of view from the, uh, uh, generally from a higher educational point of view, what does success look like as we all try to embrace this category of cybersecurity? I think for, you know, for, uh, for the state, uh, I think if it becomes known as a place that has, um, that is a locus for interesting work, uh, whether as a response center, uh, whether uh, for uh, research to some degree uh, and all the other things NCIC is doing. If it's known as a locus globally for that kind of work, then I think NCIC will be successful. And I think if it's known, you know, if it's well known as that in a year, uh, that's, that's meaningful. If it takes us five years, that's, that's a little too long. So when I think of NCIC, I think of it really as an iconic effort to put the state on the map generally in the world of cybersecurity as a place where the really critical, a lot of really critical work is going on. People want to come. To they want to come and they, want to, and they just know that great stuff's happening here, a little bit like Israel. You know, people identify Israel as a place where the coolest stuff's happening in cybersecurity. Why not Colorado? We're, we're almost, we're geographically bigger. Well, the excitement you're showing here, definitely I hope it gets that point across. Yeah. And for the university? Well, I, you know, we, we judge our success by really three areas. One, are we of real service? Um, you know, we're, we're dedicated to the public good. So are, are we serving Colorado's need? Or are we serving national? Are we serving international needs? Um, second, you know, we are about education. So are we giving people an education? Are we giving them preparation? Um, preparation to have jobs, but also preparation to address these issues, no matter what field they're in, if they're in business or law or social work. Um, and third, research. You know, are we contributing to the body of knowledge that helps address cybersecurity? Okay. So kind of in closing, anything that you want to get out about either Denver University, things you need help with, things you need support from, people might be listening that can get involved with. Well, I, you know, I, I hope people hear this as a clear example um, that the University of Denver is um, very much wanting to engage with the big issues of the state in the Rocky Mountain area, that we're very concerned about making sure that we live up to our responsibility to educate leaders and professionals, and that we are uh, very good at and enjoy very much partnering with institutions, private institutions, corporations, um, but also our wonderful state universities. All right. Well, thank you both for joining today. I do definitely appreciate and respect your input, and I'm sure the listeners will enjoy it as well. Thank Great. you. Thanks a lot. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of New Cyber Frontier. Remember to get involved. Often we think that someone else will handle privacy and security in the virtual world, but you are the only one truly in command of your virtual fate. Join our mailing list so we can keep you informed of breaking news and new releases. If you have an idea, if you have a question that you would like to hear answered, or if you want to get involved with our efforts, reach out to us at newcyberfrontier.com. We also encourage you to visit our sponsors' links as they are the ones that really make this show possible. I want to thank each of you for supporting the show, and we look forward to seeing you back for the next episode of New Cyber Frontier.